Hi, everyone. Welcome to Jewish Museum Milwaukee's Conversation Starters. I am thrilled today to be joined by Vince Trippi from Milwaukee Pride. Um, he is the director of education there. He has so many different hats that he wears. He does instructional design for a major healthcare company. He is, all, it, sorry, instructional design. Um, he also trains scout masters and boy scouts. He does HIV counseling. But today we're really going to be exploring his universe through education, through Milwaukee Pride Fest and what that means in our community. Um, so Vince, let's throw this out here. W what is going on with um, Pride Fest this year in 2020 in the time of COVID? Yeah, so uh, right when lockdowns uh, started um, becoming a, a matter of daily life uh, for, for people in Wisconsin, uh, around March 18th is when we made the decision as a board to postpone Pride Fest. And about two months later uh, in May, we made the decision to actually just outright cancel Pride Fest in Milwaukee for uh, at least this year. Um, we may be able to do some other Pride events, celebrations. It really comes down to what's best for public health. Um, our community has been greatly affected by public health outbreaks in the past, and we want to be very sensitive to that, to the health disparities that affect the LGBT community. And so we, we're just really taking our, our cues from public health agencies and public health department and following the rules and regulations that are, are set before us, make sure that we're doing the responsible thing. Are you finding ways to kind of coalesce in this new online universe and to bring people together or is that kind of still in process? Certainly. So it's not all centering around Pride Fest. Pride Fest is definitely a party with a purpose. Um, we are a, a large grantor um, and that's really what Pride Fest is, is it's a big fundraiser. Um, but in, in these times when people are without work, um, sometimes having um, to take care of people that maybe are more independent in the best of times. Um, we're, we're really letting other organizations take the, take the spotlight. So the, the bars are really dependent on, for example, people coming in and uh, enjoying the ambiance and buying drinks and things like that. Can't really do that so much um, when you've got lockdowns and quarantines and things like that. So a lot of those organizations have been putting on drag shows on Twitch and um, trivia nights and things like that. And that's really good community organizing and, and we don't want to take the spotlight from that. But it's also given us unique opportunities to deliver um, content and connections. So like Woodland Pattern uh, participated in NEA's Big Read program this year and the selection they chose was a, uh, an anthology of um, transgender poetry, basically, by, by Stephanie Burt. Um, the book's called Advice from Lights, where um, she kind of imagines a, a childhood growing up as a little girl. And it was really fascinating to have these uh, virtual book discussions facilitated by several different organizations. It wasn't just one thing at one time with one group of people. It was several different discussions going on uh, among several different groups. And that kind of thing doesn't usually happen when we all focus on the, the physicality of getting together in one place to do a thing. So we've had, we've had interesting advances and, and in other ways, withdrawals. Yeah, I think that's kind of the, that a lot of communities are finding this, like that there are ways of engaging, but it's a very different atmosphere. And, and how do you, and, and is there a way to reclaim some of that spark or do we just need to kind of transition how we do things? Um, with that said, are there kind of specific needs in the LGBTQ community that are coming to the fore at this moment? Or is it more kind of in the realm of being supporters and allied to the communities that are affected? Yeah, so I can think of a, a couple. Um, the ones that are really high on my list are um, especially um, people who are isolated or otherwise vulnerable. So LGBTQ seniors are a population that's uh, of high concern 
in, again, the best of times, but right now um, it, they can be especially isolated. So um, something as simple as writing the, the LGBT identified seniors in your life, a postcard, a couple times a month maybe, you know, not, it, there are not a lot of text fits on a postcard. So it's not gonna take you hours and hours to do this, but like that can really brighten the, the life of, of someone who's feeling really isolated. Uh, on this, the other side of that token, there are people who are isolated, not necessarily by choice, right? So um, LGBT identified inmates um, in the prison system. Um, uh, there's an organization called Black and Pink Milwaukee that coordinates getting cards and um, even pairing up pen pals with uh, queer identified folks who are uh, incarcerated and making sure that um, they not only have some connection to someone on the outside, but also like there's a lot of violence that takes place in prisons and mail call is a really focal part of uh, prison life. So seeing that someone on the outside cares about this person on the inside um, so it makes them less of a target for violence from, from all directions. So those are two things that uh, really jump off my, my uh, radar right away. But um, participating in these virtual events, whether it's, you know, Chamber on Tap with the LGBTQ Chamber of Commerce or, you know, drag shows, tipping drag queens for their performances virtually, um, or like book discussions with Woodland Pattern and, and all these other sorts of like get togethers, meet and greets. Um, those are in, in some ways just entertainment, but also they can be really important for finding out information that you wouldn't have access to maybe otherwise. So like um, Forge, which is a very large uh, and important trans and gender non-conforming um, support group, as well as I guess research institute, um, they've been partnering with Medical College of Wisconsin uh, and Freighter's Inclusion Clinic and, and getting information out to folks in a fun, but also an engaging way. Um, so ask a doc, but also game nights and things like that. Um, that's, also, that's, oh yeah, go ahead. No, that's key to have those people that are both like um, authorities, you know, that you have that kind of medical insight, but you also have that ability to, to, to be engaging and fun. So it's not just like, wait, we're mm -hmm. gonna tell you what you should be yes. doing. Yeah, for sure. Uh, some of the other things that uh, are maybe a little more, more mundane are just like things that affect everybody, but really acutely affect um, a wide range of minority groups. So like unemployment, people working in the service industry, um, people dealing with food insecurity and potentially even um, homelessness. Um, home is not a safe place for people whose families would rather that their other family members not be the way that they are, right? So um, large institutions like um, the UW system I know are aware of and taking steps to make sure that LGBT identified individuals who live in their dorms aren't turned out of the dorms and have to return to an environment that might not be safe for them. Um, especially if we're going to be uh, together for long periods or undetermined amounts of time. Um, yeah. But, I um, think that that's also that flip side of, you know, the kind of complaints on, oh, I can't believe we've been in our home for so long. And then this really is this opportunity to develop, you know, robust empathy to really think about, well, so your home and the biggest challenge is that you can't do this, this or this, but you know, who are those people that really, that home is a challenge, you know, yeah. how do we, and how do we assist them? How do we find ways to, to make sure that they're safe and um, that their needs are being addressed? So I love being able to make a platform for that. Um, what, you know, you as the education director at uh, Milwaukee Pride, what does that mean? What does that entail? Yeah, uh, it's kind of a, a, an unofficial title. Um, our board is very much a working board and we have a fantastic and 
um, expansive production team that puts on the the big event Pride Fest, but our organization really strives to be a, a year-round nonprofit organization. Um, so we do partner with some other uh, Milwaukee institutions to do collaborative events. Um, I personally really focus on the history exhibit and then the Stonewall stage at Pride Fest. And then year round, I kind of do that same Stonewall stage programming at Stonewall stage talks, which are, you know, speaker series like you might see in, in coffee shops, those sorts of things, talking about all sorts of stuff. So some of the things that we've talked about just in the past year were uh, we had a panel put together on where does the LGBT community go post marriage equality? Um, that's sometimes a really difficult thing to wrap your head around. And it's certainly, opinions vary based on what your position is just in the larger socioeconomic structure of society. Um, and um, we had Bi Plus Pride, which is a, a relatively new organization in Milwaukee, do a myth-busting edition of Bisexuality 101. And it's incredible to think about, you know, people who identify as bisexual may be erased or, or uh, reduced in number because people think, oh, well, I don't want to be on that spectrum of, of things. But when you, when you get down to it, a lot of people actually probably are bisexual and maybe they claim a label and maybe they don't. Maybe they go by a different term like pansexual or omnisexual or something like that. But um, that, that kind of programming is really good for getting people who are part of the LGBT community more uh, exposed to different types of people and the, and the incredible breadth and diversity within the LGBT community. But it also gives people who are um, allies or, or just have no idea about like, well, what's intersex mean? How, how, what, how's that work? Um, giving them an opportunity to see like people who are willing to put themselves out there and answer questions. And um, you don't always have opportunities like that, just walking around um, or on Facebook, which is also like, it can be difficult to get straight answers off of Facebook for one reason or another. <laughs> I mean, once you start diving into the internet for answers, that is when you sometimes come up with some really crazy things. Yeah, um, flame wars are a thing, um, especially yeah. when you start talking about uh, queer identified folks, yeah. In terms of the kind of exhibits that you've put on so far, where, what has been that kind of, that your, fo your focus is thus far? Yeah, so before I joined the organization, our um, LGBT uh, history project um, forerunners were really involved in doing oral histories and documenting everything that they could onto um, different biogra biographical panels. So we would display those at uh, Pride Fest but also uh, Don Schwamm, who is the, the founder of the Wisconsin LGBTQ History Project. Uh, he maintains a website and um, maybe we'll put the link up here. Um, the, uh, that website is basically a labor of love of his for uh, the past 10 plus years. And um, uh, he's been working with Michael Takash, who was uh, recently on our board and moved out to LA. Uh, to pursue job opportunities out there. And he uh, wrote the book on LGBT Milwaukee. Um, so they, they are really involved in, in finding new ways to get history content out to the community even now. Um, for me, I've been really interested in um, not just the, the personalities and the uh, social history, the, the bars and, and who was where, but also like the, the development of identities, where these identities come from, the, the kind of history of ideas in the queer community. So last year being the 50th anniversary of uh, Stonewall, I put together an exhibit on Stonewall uh, using the very few pictures that we have from the night, uh, as well as some pictures of like drag queens in the 1940s, like 
the things that go on now are not nearly as new as we think they are a lot. Um, and so hearkening back to the, the queer community that was um, can, when you look at that, you're like, well, um, you know, I'm, I'm not this aberration. Um, I have a people and we go back a ways and that gives you um, uh, an encouragement politically, socially. Um, I'm part of I'm, a continuum. Yeah. Um, yeah. In thinking about that, just from a Milwaukee standpoint, how do you, how would you kind of uh, express what that evolution has looked like? You know, when, when is the kind of earliest record of LGBTQ um, identity in Wisconsin emerge? Yeah, so uh, Dick Wagner actually just released two volumes uh, over the last two years um, on queer life in Wisconsin, and he goes back to the territorial days. So Wisconsin became a state in 1848, so at least that far back. Um, but there's, there's a long history of, of queer folks in, you know, logging encampments and... Yeah, no, and that, and I think one of the things that looking at that continuum really says is that it debunks this idea that this is all new and this is sure. all part of some sort of modern movement that happened in the last, you know, 10, 15, 20 years, that this mm -hmm. is, even 50 years, that this is a much bigger process. This is an identity. This isn't a, you know, uh, this isn't something people take on. This is something that has been happening since. Exactly. And, and it varies by culture as well. So the, the indigenous populations of American Indians in Wisconsin also experience gender and sexuality in ways that uh, European settlers often found disturbing, right? So mm -hmm. the, the modern two-spirit identity um, is kind of the, the amalgam of pan-Indian ideas about gender and sexuality. Um, we were working on bringing a, um, an individual to speak from uh, Minnesota, who's working on a PhD in American Indian Studies, and um, hopefully we'll be able to get them back once um, my my collaborators are able to open their space back up. <laughs> no, that sounds. I think that's a fascinating topic. I know your research, and this is where Jewish Museum Milwaukee and Pride Fest intersected, has been directed kind of at Weimar Germany in the past few years and exploring specifically some questions of identity there. Could you give yeah. us a sense, of, kind of a preview of what you've been looking at? Certainly. So I have been um, a, just amassing a huge number of queer titles on my book list. And as I was working down them, um, one of the ones that I finally decided to pick up because I was going on vacation to visit the in-laws down in Florida, uh, you know how that goes, um, picked up Gay Berlin and started reading that and um, a, really got a sense for the, the ways that gender and sexuality were constructed out of this pan-German project of constructing sexualities out of behaviors. Um, so the, we got um, a Hanoverian jurist named uh, Carl Ulrichs, who, uh, with his uh, pen pal, Maria uh, Kerbeni, came up with this concept of homosexual and heterosexual, which were eventually pathologized and medicalized and um, then criminalized. Um, when did that happen? What 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 year about? Sure. So uh, Ulrichs and Kerpeni were were corresponding in the 1860s, um, and I think yeah, 68 is the letter where the the words debuted, um, and it it spread across the the territories that became Germany. Of course, Germany is is kind of is much more modern invention than homosexuality, right? Um, so um, there was this incredible dialogue going on at the time in the medical scientific community, but there was also a rich culture developing in Berlin and elsewhere where you had balls and drag shows. And um, I mean, the, the um, 
prostitution and and cruising for sex like these things were um not always in the hidden uh in the hidden sphere they were sometimes very public and there were you know positive and, and negative things that we can ascribe to that uh, whether it's you know the the toughening up of of anti-sodomy laws in prussia or like oh well there was a queer identified monarch in in europe like they're fantastic things that were kept out of certainly my education growing up that that these people existed and and not always um, in ways that we would think of as like outcast from society. In terms of kind of looking at the identity around uh, the interwar period in Germany, um, and and you know, I think a lot of us have this kind of sense of that identity from Cabaret, you know, which is basically yeah. for Isher, Isherwood's book. What is your research kind of uh, in? What is your research exposing as you look at this? Um, and exposing is the wrong word. Uh, but it's showing as you're um, yeah. at this period. And who are the personalities that emerge? Sure. So Isherwood is a really key one to bring up. So he's a British guy, uh, author. Um, he's in Berlin um, taking notes with uh, the little German that he has access to. And he um, finds that there's this term, schwul, which means like humid or warm. And it's kind of a the slang term for for gay man um, arising out of the euphemism like warm warm brother for for gay men, and he's like, we don't have a word for this like a non judgmental non loaded word for this in my home country in Britain. Like this is amazing. Like there were lots of other terms like sodomite or bugger and things like that but the identity wasn't there it was you know criminal acts um so the that environment is is really eye-opening for him um so that's like on the, on the social side and actually um like cabaret is is one depiction of that you've also got uh bent which is uh, a depiction of uh, life in a concentration camp. And that actually starts on the night of long knives. And you can see a bit of the, the incredible cabaret like ball atmosphere of that interwar German period. And then like right to the, to add to the end of that. Um, but in, in that period that the scientific medical community, you, you've got people who are fascinated by gender and sexuality as distinct categories, which was, isn't always the way that like people now construct or think about gender, sex, sexuality. So Magnus Hirschfeld really comes to the fore in, in these kinds of discussions. He um, speaks at in, um, conferences, professional conferences, he publishes, he opens up a uh, institute for sex research where he treats patients for psychological as well as uh, physical ailments uh, and, and conditions. So through his uh, network, they perform some of the first gender confirmation or sex reassignment surgeries, um, offer hormone therapies, contraception. What year is this? What, what time period are we in here? That institute, I think, was founded in 1919. And right after World War One, this is yeah, right there, and and it it went on into um, that uh, the the rise of of the Nazi Party right up until um, they started burning books, which actually that's something really important to note is like the picture that you imagine when you think of book burning. Book burnings happened all over the place, but the pictures that you're thinking of uh, were Hirschfeld's Institutes the library and archives. So they had 20,000 some books, many of them rare, uh, as well as 5,000 photographs that are just gone. Um, really the, the Nazi movement was kind of the, the first transgender erasure in a lot of ways. Um, How 
quickly is the Institute shut down once the Nazis come to power? Pretty quickly. Um, Hitler knew about Hirschfeld personally and did not like the guy. So Hirschfeld wasn't um, out, but he was prolifically involved with gay people. So he served as uh, an expert witness in um, prosecutions. He also uh, was a pioneer in film. So they, he actually um, produced and appeared in starring as himself. Um, uh, a film called Different from the Others is the English title. I don't, won't pretend to speak German. Uh, so that, that film is like the first positive depiction of a homosexual in the world. And indeed, it's like one of the first filmed period. Um, and after some period of time, it was censored in, in certain principalities in um, Germany because it was you know, not deemed appropriate for the common man. And it was only restricted to psychologists and, and those sorts of folks. But those, those did not uh, garner him any favor from, from the Nazis. And, and Hitler has specifically said not, not nice things about Hirschfeld, um, being a, a pacifist, being a socialist, and being, in fact, like a gay polyamorous <laughs> um, sex researcher. And so what happens to Hirschfeld? So Hirschfeld goes on a uh, world tour, um, leaving his partner uh, behind in Berlin. Um, and it's while he's on tour that the Nazis come to power, sack, and, uh, sack the Institute and uh, actually send the then president of the organization that he helped found um, to a concentration camp, um, which has like a whole other fascinating side of the story to it. Uh, he tours Indonesia, France, the US, all sorts of uh, places in the world, picks up uh, another uh, partner in, in the Far East, um, and eventually settles down in uh, Nice in France and tries to start up uh, or restart the Institute in Paris, uh, but ultimately he dies in 1934. So not, not long after the, the rise of, of Hitler. Well, I think, and one of the things we are looking forward to doing in the future is to exploring this story in more depth and some of these other, you know, kind of stories um, around LGBTQ identity and the Holocaust and uh, the rise of Nazism with you um, and with Milwaukee Pride. Um, this is, a every time I've talked to you, I'm fascinated by this piece of history because I think it's, yeah. you know, there's so many things that people don't know that I'm really excited to explore. In terms of kind of that role that Pride Fest plays, how, how do you feel like, um, what are ways that we as a broader community can help and assist in that kind of educational goal? So I think it's really important for anyone doing public history or community education such that we do to consider the the real scope of the identities that our, our communities are, are made up of, right? So there are queer people who are Jewish, there are queer people who are Buddhist, there are queer, like of every um, stripe really. And uh, to say that there is a singular, like a gay narrative or gay history of the United States or any particular place in the world at any time uh, it's just not telling the whole story. So by partnering with um, organizations or people who aren't like you as a programmer, really give not only a, a fuller picture of the stories that you're trying to tell or expose, uncover, re reintroduce to the world, but also they, like, they do the work of community or public education much better, right? Because um, not everyone who comes to Pride Fest looks like me, right? Um, and it's really important to me that Pride Fest be a place where folks can come to express 
their their full selves, the full range of identities that make them up, but also to see that reflected back to them at Pride Fest. So um, I've only been doing this two years. Um, I'm trying to work my way through themes, but um, always looking for for people to call me out, tell me what I what they'd like to see, um, and and find ways for for other folks to get involved in, in developing content. Well, thank you so much. Is there anything else that you want to add as we're- um... I forgot to say that Hirschfeld was Jewish. Like that was the whole, the <laughs> whole thing, right? Like... I, I mean, I had assumed that, but I also think that is a fair, you know, that we can't just say yeah. that having that out there and out there is, is important as well. You know what? It does occur to me uh, something else that gets uncovered um, covered quite a bit. Um, so the the Nazi anti sodomy law, paragraph one seventy five, was like a souped up version of pre Nazi sodomy anti sodomy laws. That didn't go away with the denazification process. So oftentimes, men who wore the pink triangle in the concentration camps that didn't count as prison service. So they actually were sometimes rearrested and sent to prison. And very few of them, like half a dozen, have even released memoirs because until the 1990s, they were still criminals. Um, so we don't have a lot of history from Nazi erasure, but also from suppression by post-Nazi governments. Um, with the Soviets being slightly easier um, than the than the Allied occupied occupied zones. That is fascinating. Um, I I am so excited to learn more about this, and I so appreciate your time, and am excited to see Pride Fest back in future years, and recognize the kind of leadership that you guys are taking and saying, "Hey, right now, what we need is to be safe more than than an awesome party with." awesome everything yeah um so thank you but we're all looking forward we know there is no one in the community that cannot wait for it we're all waiting really for that awesome party to reemerge. thanks ellie <laughs> thank you so much and uh if you've enjoyed this conversation starter feel free to make a contribution at jewishmuseummilwaukee.org or pridefest um and have a wonderful day <laughs>